Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, without further ado, I think you're all here for some stories, so um, let me introduce you my story. Um, a few years back, I was in a student organization and we organized a conference. We wanted to have some interaction because it was the COVID times where people come meet, and so um, we wanted to have a quiz. We want to write it our own because we want to make it privacy aware and don't send all the data to Google and so, but um, so the idea was that users could answer questions like how old is the universe after talk on um, astronomy. And so I was the computer scientist and the guy who was trying to do a PhD at the time and I was like, that's the job I was made for. That's why I studied seven years in this field, developed security analyst. So what I thought about was just having a client application. The client asked regularly the server for, hey, do you have a question? If not, hmm? Uh, then not, and if you have a question, please send it to me, and then the client could answer. And then we have an admin interface that allows the admin to set the questions and to set the next question. And then we have a server that essentially stores all the data in a JSON file, because I thought, like, with Donald Move, pretty much optimization is the root of all evil. So I thought it was a good idea to store all the data in a JSON file and let the file system do the optimization. Because we only had like 100 users or so expected, so it was fine. Um, and then the event came, and anyone can guess what happened? Anyone? Yeah, it crashed, of course. Uh, that's why I'm doing this <laughs> self-defacing team. Uh, self-defacing, sorry. Of course the server was overwhelmed, and we're filming this on a central location because we could fit like 10 people in a room, and this was allowed by current regulations. And I sat there all evening resetting the server. I can tell you it was really nice. So um, I essentially mistook the quote and pretty much the optimization because the full quote is, you should forget about small efficiency, say about 97% of the time, pretty much optimization is the root of all evil. Yet we should not pass up our critical op our opportunities in the critical 3%. A good programmer will, will not be allowed into complacency by such reasoning. He will be wise to look at the critical code, but only after that code has been identified. And so how do we, even how do we identify this code? That's where profiles come to rescue. Um, and I have a few friends that aren't computer scientists that do nothing with computers and won't tell them I'm a profiler. They, they think like, I'm, are you someone like Sherlock Holmes looking for crime suspects? The weird thing is, yeah, I'm kind of looking for, crimes, for crime suspect, but it's not like the person who did it. Yes, I could do get blind, but it was me. I wrote the code. But I'm looking for the specific location um, and to, to use, I think it's Peter Tutsanov or something. I'm not that good in Bulgarian. Um, he's probably a more local version, and that's my face when I debug a when I debug a really difficult problem in OpenJDK, and the problem doesn't go away. So uh, essentially, um, or when I try to get to the venue to, to do my talk and to prepare my slides, and then I'm stuck in a traffic jam. Oh my God. <laughs> There should be a profile of doing going on to this and solving this problem. But anyway, um, so when we solving real problems, because I think the traffic jam isn't a real problem, it just happens to be here all the time. Um, what we usually do is we use a flame graph. So the flame graph essentially gives you a simple visualization of how many, how much time every part of the code took in relation to other codes. Apart. So essentially what you see in the bottom is the main method. The main method runs the whole time, so the bar is full width. What you see in the top is some kind of pseudocode, just to make your life easier, but I think when you, you get the picture. So essentially the main um, method did you know, some setup code, getting the port and everything ready, and then it has a server loop. And what did the server loop do? Um, it essentially uh, runs some, some other code, like handling admin requests, but the most handled question is, the, oh, is there a question? Because my client, every 10 minutes, every 10 seconds, asks, hey, is there a question? And so what you see here, the server loop takes most of the time of the main method, as we expect, and the handle question request takes most of the time um, of the server loop. And then what does this handle question request do? It's quite simple. It asks, hey, do you have currently a question enabled? Um, if yes, Emit it. If not, don't emit it. That's simple. Um, and 
sorry. Uh, I press the button. Cool. Um, anyone can guess what this application is running most of the time? What is the code that, like, current question and this question enabled running most of the time on top of this? Any guesses? Has something to do with JSON? It's, of course, JSON parsing. So essentially, I'm storing all the data in the file system. I pass the JSON every time. So my application is essentially bound by the performance of the JSON parser, which isn't really great because my, my whole server application is essentially a whole I pass JSON. It's like a paperclip factory. Um, so what you see here is to, to quote Mario Fusco, all our frame graphs, when you do something stupid, it punches you in your face, and it's impossible not to see it. And we saw it here. It's like not great. So if you then replace it by a proper database, in this case SQLite, because the data isn't that large at all, overall, yeah, the application runs, well, I fixed the issue. The problem is COVID is over, so we haven't used it ever after, but that's fine. Uh, it's a good example for, for Demons. And you see um, how you can use some simple frame graphs to solve a problem that um, crashes the application in kind of production. So um, I think you should know that profiling belongs to your toolbox. Like the debugging techniques, like testing techniques, and like profiling, especially because you usually use profiling to debug a um, performance issue, and then you should probably add some load tests um, that prevent you from making the same errors again. So who am I to talk about profiles? Yes, um, as I was introduced in the beginning, I work at a small little company called SAP. Um, that's the German kind of saying it. I usually talk about profiles, as, as I do here. Um, I work at a beautiful submachine team. We're a little team. Uh, we're the third biggest contributor to the OpenJK. Um, we produce such nice things as the better null pointer exceptions or um, maintain all the versions of Java. If you want to have stickers, they are here, and you probably find a um, few at the SAP booth back there. Um, our team that we work in um, works also on Gardner. Um, we're doing lots of Kubernetes stuff, lots of cool stuff. And the, the office, I was there yesterday uh, to give a talk there. The SAP office has a really nice rooftop terrace. If you have the chance to go there, go there. It's really nice. And I like your mountains. I hope I have enough time to merge them. Right. Anyway, um, when I don't travel, I work on profiling stuff um, and help you make the world better by adding new profiling features. Um, so now that I that you know a bit about me, um, how about you? Who of you used the profiler? Yay, cool. It rises every time I give the talk. Maybe it's because of me or because people notice that profiling is really cool. Anyway, so when JetBrains asked the people in 2022, they, they got a similar so we, result, so that's nice. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know profiling, uh, what it is, uh, I search for a short description, and I found it in the Hacker's Dictionary from the 1990s. So they write that um, the profile itself, so the thing that you generate, is a report on the amounts of time spent in each routine of a program. You used to find it, you know, where the, hotspot in, in the hotspots in it. So that's essentially what we do. We try to find issues and use the, and, and use the results of the profiling to um, make our application more performant, which is real nice. So um, after this, you might, you might uh, wonder whether there are profiles existing, so, or what do we have to write our own? But yes, they are existing profiles, and they fall in two different categories, essentially. We have instrumenting profiles. So um, for one, we have instrumenting profiles that insert instructions into the code automatically. So consider this code here. We have the server loop, as you've seen before. And an easy way to see how long this server loop took is at the beginning, we take the time. For example, the system the current time mill is. At the end, we print the time difference. And that's fine. Um, it works. It shows us, oh, the server loop took like 10 seconds or such. But how can we automate this? That's quite easy. We essentially insert bytecode or instrumentation. Um, that the being that at the beginning says, oh, I'm entering this method, and then the end, it says, oh, I'm exiting, and so you can uh, collide these two and then see the end, oh, 
these methods took so much time. And it's really cool because you're getting every method execution. Um, the main problem is um, the profile code isn't your production code. So when you profile the code, you're modifying this code. And just-in-time compilers hate you for this because that's new code inserted. That's probably because many Java methods shouldn't be too large. It's probably a substantial part of the Java code running in every method is just logging code. And so when you're not profiling the code that you're running in production or running really, so what's the, what's the meaning of the profiling uh, results? So um, here it's, it still has its merits. For example, you see every execution and you get a pretty detailed pictures, but that's well, not that great. So um, people started then in the 1990s developed sampling profilers. So the idea with sampling profilers is instead of getting like an exact picture but modifying the code, we get a rough picture, but it's good enough and it's far faster. So what sampling profile does, it asks the JVM regularly like, hey, what are you currently executing? What are you currently executing? And so on. And usually asks this like every 10 to 20 milliseconds and we get a rough picture because here, um, the, the profile code is the production code because we're externally asking the JVM. Um, of course, it only gets, gets you an approximation, but that's usually not a problem. We don't usually care about methods that only like run for 10 milliseconds, but we usually care for methods that took a long time. And so this is the way that most current um, profiles work and that also most current uh, monitoring tools, other tools, um, work, uh, and that's why I'm focusing here in this talk. So um, after you heard this, you probably think that profiles are rock and science, but they aren't, and so that's what I thought too, and so I thought, like, how can I tell people that they aren't rocket science? Um, I started to write my own in, like, uh, some lines of Java code, and I wrote a blog post about it, and people liked it, and if I'm honest, uh, in my initial blog post, it was like I write it in 204 lines of pure Java code. The problem was people on Hacker News found that I had concurrency issues because concurrency is hard. Um, so it's 250 lines. So yeah, um, it, that's how it goes. Um, even small applications can have terrible um, uh, problems with concurrency. Um, but anyway, so how is, uh, how is the fraud structure of this? Um, you essentially have a main class that does all the um, CLI handling, that does all the handling of the arguments. Then you have then this main class starts a profile, and what does the profile does? It samples and asks JVM, hey, what are you currently doing? Then it sleeps, then it samples, then it sleeps um, to get like an approximation. And then uh, what does it do? It stores all the data in a data store, and from this data store, um, we then get a flying graph. So I'm now going to show you all the different parts of this. So for one, when we, are in the, when we have a main method, um, we want to have an entry point somewhere. We can't use the standard Java main method because it's only for like command line applications. Um, but what we instead have, we, we call this agent, we attach this agent with minus Java agent, and then we have some agent arcs at the end. So there are two times when we can attach an agent. We can attach it in the beginning, like here, or later. And so we have two different methods. For one, we have the agent main method that's called whenever you attach it later. And then we have the pre-main method whenever you attach it before. Um, so in pre-main. So what we then have, we I wrote some option parsing. I don't show it to you because it's really simple. I just asked ChatGPT to write it for me because I have like three options like interval, where I should apply the flame curve and such. Um, so uh, we just run it and we run our main method. And um, what this does, we have to create a new thread because um, our agent runs in the same main thread as our application, which isn't great. So we have to start a new thread um, for profiling instance. Um, and then how does the profiler work? As I said, you sample you sleep. But what's interesting is that um, what one do is the when the profiler when the application ends the profiler should write something out, and there's a cool thing called the sh a shutdown hook. So the idea is that whenever the JVM is shut down, um, so whenever the JVM is shut down, 
Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, voice recognition. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, funny thing I made like two two months ago. I did a debugging talk for Python, and my demo didn't work. So in my debugging talk on Python, we debug my debugging debugger demo, which was really nice to debug a debugger on stage by giving a debugging debugger talk. Anyway, um, I also profile the profiler if you want to. Yes, it's really nice. Uh, your mind doesn't crash. Um, no, it's like Inception, and you take the red pill, and it gives you a flame drop. Anyway, um, so essentially, the ad shown the, the ad <laughs> hook <laughs> um, it calls essentially profile on end, just writes down everything. And but we also have when you write such code, you also have to be aware that um, you can't do add this hook in the profile constructor because in the profile constructor um, the object might be not might not be fully initialized. So when you use the things with with these hooks, be aware that Java can sometimes be mess and that uh, uh, then that implementing potentially parallel algorithms is is hard. If you want to know more, I think there was the Lincheck talk yesterday, which was real nice and showing you what else can go wrong. But anyway, um, that worked here after people on Hacker News told it to me how it should work. Um, so anyway, um, what the sample method does, I think I don't have to tell you how sleep works. You just call thread to sleep. Um, what the sample method does, it just wants to ask a subset of the threads, hey, um, please give me, um, please give me all the stack traces. The problem in Java is we can only ask for all threads that are currently running by asking thread dot get all stack traces for all stack traces, so we already have them. And the stack traces are essentially the stack traces that you get when you have exceptions. And then we essentially ask, hey, is this a demon? Because our profile, we say before, it's a demon. So it doesn't impact the whole application. So when, um, and when it's a demon, we discard it, but otherwise, we add a sample to the store. And Sectorist elements contain lots of information like um, the method name, the file name, the line number, and such. Um, but we just store the method and the class name to make our life easier. Then to the store. The, the idea of the store to store data efficiently. Um, what we're doing here, we're um, exploiting the fact that we only export a flame graph because then we can use an efficient data structure. But otherwise, like modern production profilers, that are also um, kind of working on, um, they use different data structure, that's just an example. Um, so flank graphs in the end would be great, it would be great to, to, to have these kind of graphs. So how can we get them from some samples? So as you know, um, we need, we, with this flame graph we know there are samples and now we're going like back from the samples to flame graphs again. So essentially um, when we pick a flame, when we pick a sample here, it's like the there's main on the bottom, then it called server loop, then it called handy question request, then called count question, and then post JSON. Um, we can also see it this way. And then um, we want to we want to construct a tree. So we have a main node, and we denote, oh, we found this node once. Then we have a server loop, and so on. And now we're getting the next trace. Oh, it's a similar trace call. So, oh, we got already the main node. Nice, we increment its number but already the server loop number and so on. And now we have different trays that misses the post JSON on top. So of course, we increment all numbers besides post JSON. And now we're having something different on top, is question enabled and then post JSON, so the tree branches. And the cool thing is this tree is pretty efficient um, and allows us to write a fast custom profiler um, without having to deal with all the data storage issues. Um, and yeah, this is why also my profile is really memory efficient. It's more memory efficient than all the profile I noticed outside, uh, which I found really, uh, which I found really interesting. Anyway, um, so when we have this tree now, um, we can create our own flank graph. So um, we have our main method, so we know that the largest bar is at maximum four, four long. So means that like it's not four intervals long because it just means that at every interval we, we hit this um, four times. Um, and so there's a distinction between like timing and, and uh, hits, but usually you can assume that when you hit it like four times, it run around four times the interval size. 
Anyway, so we have the main, then we have the server loop. It's also four time units long. Um, then we have handy question request, current question, and this question enabled, and a top pass JSON. And that's how you come from a flame graph to the samples back to the um, back to the flame graph. The cool thing here is with the flame graphs, we essentially throw away, throw away the temporary information. So we throw away the information on when every sample happened, but that reduces the amount of data greatly. Um, then, essentially, um, I threw this into some, some code. I didn't write a flame graph library myself, but there's these three flame graphs out, uh, out there, and it can produce a flame graph quite well. And so we see it here. Um, this is a flame graph for a sample application. And it's cool, so you can write a profile in a couple of lines of code. In reality, um, when I did this talk first time in Milan, someone came up to me after and said, like, oh, I'm a consultant at a bank and we can't run profiles in production, so can I just use your code and run it on production <laughs> in, in, in the bank's application? Yeah, that's the problem when you do open source. The profile is like MIT licensed. And then another guy came, wrote in some form that he wants to use it to profile JavaScript in VMware applications, whatever. Be aware when you do open source, people use it for weird stuff. Um, anyway, in reality, you don't usually write your own profile, except if you work on writing profiles, um, which I sometimes do. But in reality, um, there are different sampling profiles. And so I'm showing you here a few open source sampling profiles. Um, there are, of course, others there. But essentially, we have external and built-in profiles, so external to the JVM or built into the JVM. So the external ones can be um, split into two groups, the synchronous and the asynchronous ones. Synchronous means you ask the JVM and it gets back to you with the stack traces whenever it likes to. And the asynchronous one is like, give me the stack trace, and the JVM replies. Uh, this might crash your application sometimes and uh, because the JVM might be in a state that's unsafe, but um, there are people working hard that it doesn't crash your application, and usually it doesn't. But so with the synchronous ones, um, you have Visual VM, which was like one of the first open source profiles in 2010, and it was also integrated in like NetBeans, and that's actually the first profile that I used while I was at school and at uni. And there's also the asynchronous ones. Um, so any one of you know the Forte Analyzer from Sun? And one of you, no one, any one of you, you know Sun, the company? Yay, that's cool in Java community. Uh, everyone knows Sun. Yeah, they, in, in 1991, they had the idea to write a fault analyzer on, it's like a performance tool. And then in 2020, and then in 2002, they added the async get call trace method, which essentially allows you externally to ask the JVM, hey, what are you currently running? Um, give me the stack traces of a specific thread. And then nothing happened for a few years. And then in 27, someone discovered, hey, you could still use this method. Because it was, it was added like, and then removed three months later, but it still lingered in there. You could use DL open to, to access it. Um, and then uh, people started using it. And in 2016, Andre Pangin started working on async profile, which is currently like the um, external profile, essentially, that you, you might want to use. Um, and there's also built-in profiles. Um, so there's the um, JDK flight recorder in the OpenJDK. It was named Java flight recorder before, but then um, the OpenJDK began, so it was called JK flight recorder. And so it was created in, this whole tool was created like in 2005 by the J Rocket guys um, uh, uh, with Marcus Heat and such. And the idea was they want to have an internal tool, and then it was commercialized in, 20 in open source in 2018. And now it's like the built-in profiler. Um, and usually when you look into modern tools like APMs from Elasticsearch, from Grafana, typically use a combination of like async profiler and JFR because they have different pros and cons. And that's the cool thing about open source. You can just merge code and take both sides and take the best of all. But please take profiles with a grain of salt. Um, Yes, and this is the first time attempt ever to me at a presentation, but that's cool. Yeah, take profiles like 
grain of salt like beamers. I shouldn't have pressed from the start. Good. Um, good, I only have like 60 slides in my presentation. So take profiles with a grain of salt because as you see, um, even presentation softwares and beamers that run here for a long time don't work that well sometimes. And that's the same thing with profiles. Profiles are written by people like me, and you shouldn't trust me with that much, because like, profiling is really hard. You have so many issues, you can crash your JVM, and it's really hard to also obtain the correct information, because your JVM is really complex. There's a just-in-time compiler that likes to optimize things, but it makes it really hard to know what's currently happening. Um, so please take them with a grain of salt, and don't think that the profiles are like current truth, but take it as a base for your um, for your for your checks for your debugging tasks. Um, so, but if you want to use a profile and, that, and not want to create your own, you probably wonder how you use async profile in JFR and one or more. So, async profile is the profile um, that I usually use, and what you can do, you can just pass it as before. Um, um, you can just pass it as an argument to Java and just tell it like, hey, please start. And then you can tell it also different events. So in which time, so what does time mean? Is it TPU time? So the time that the thread is actually running. Is it wall clock time? So the, it's related to the runtime of the whole program um, or the, the, the whole running system. Or, I, or are there different events that you want to count there? And then there's the, and then you can also tell like, hey, please submit the flame graph, which is well nice, or please submit the JFR file, like a JDK flight recorder file, and even combine it with like running a JFR alongside, which is well nice. And um, then there's the JDK flight recorder, and the cool thing is that's included in your JDK because it's the built-in one. And um, contrary to async profiler, which only really works on Linux. This also works on all pl other platforms, but if we're honest, I'm working on like uh, OpenJK for two and a half years now, and I can tell you most of our customers are just running on Linux. Um, and that's why when we, I'm currently working on a new profiling feature also for JFR, and we're only focusing on Linux because that's good enough. Um, so yeah, I, I like Linux. Um, and anyway, um, so what you can tell uh, how to start JDK flight record, you essentially just uh, add minus xx start flight recording and tell it where to put the file. And in older versions, you also had to say, oh, please start a flight record and then to add some more options. You should definitely add that make your profiling far better. They are not enabled by default, but have almost no performance issues. And also you can attach it, of course, later um, just via J command, which is well nice. Um, you can you can attach async profile later, but there are problems because like attaching native agents nowadays um, is a bit more difficult. Um, but anyway, um, the cool thing about flight recorder is that it doesn't only record like method profiles, but what it does, it records a lot of information. And so there are so many events, like 120, that I start creating a website called uh, submachine.io slash JFI events that you find probably under this QR code, which, co which collects all the events out there um, that are built into the OpenJK with some descriptions. But as you see, there aren't that many descriptions. So if you want to contribute, it's open source, just contribute. Um, so you can also see some examples for different garbage collectors. And the cool thing is there's so many events on different things. For example, you get events for every, you can enable events for different, for all the GC phases, for all the, uh, oh, I inline the method, I de um, I de optimize the method. And that really helps um, when debugging and monitoring applications. Um, and that's what we use regularly also in um, at work here. And yeah, set compiler inline, and it shows you like, oh, it's enabled in these Java versions and in these configurations. But now, um, consider for a second that um, we're, but now consider for a second um, that we created our new startup because um, uh, there's software as a service, but there should also be math as a service. I think that's the new thing, and 
you all saw that software service is big and everyone does this, but Marfa service might be better. So essentially, it's, uh, we, we created our Fibonacci server application that gives you the worst calculated Fibonacci numbers. Um, and now you want to do some logging. Um, and what you could do, you could for this logging to know which Fibonacci number took how long. You can use um, JFR, and that's really cool because uh, we can create a session event. Um, and the idea is you create an event that extends the JFR event. We have then two properties, the session ID, so to uh, identify the user, and also the N for, because we calculate the N Fibonacci number. And then I just have a constructor here um, because I think um, uh, that that records aren't supported here, but that's essentially all. And then the cool thing is we then just create our event, we tell it to begin, so we record start time, then we come then we calculate our Fibonacci number and then we commit. And what we have then is we have a stack trace on there, we have a start time, we have an end time, and the number n and the session ID, which is really cool. And the cool thing is we can view this in all our uh, in all our JFR viewers directly, besides all our other information that we get from JFR, like method samples. And it's really, really nice um, because we don't have to write our own logger, we don't have to write our own um, viewing infrastructure. And you see here that it took like si uh, uh, 67 milliseconds to, compute the, to compute the 37th um, Fibonacci number, but be aware that's just because I used like a, a recursive version. Um, so that's really cool. Um, you can use it to, to log your application. Um, so as you probably saw by now, you can inspect profiles. I don't show you flame graphs again because you can of course use flame graphs, but sometimes flame graphs aren't enough. Sometimes you want something more. And in this case, um, you, can, uh, you can take the official OpenJK tool, and that's the JK Mission Control, sh um, short JMC. And so what JMC is, it's an application um, based on Eclipse um, that can help you analyze JFR files. For example, it can give you a short overview of the JFR file, like telling you that, hey, the application probably run on a machine with not too much RAM, and it can give you lots of information. For example, it can give you information on the Moffat profiling, it can give you flame graphs, it can give you information on GCs, and you can visualize them in some way or another. The only problem is, you probably see it here, it's based on Eclipse and not the most beautiful application, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it has a steep learning curve, it's really worth it, it's when, when you want to do lots of profiling in Java, it's worth it to learn it, but it takes you a couple of days. And um, so um, I was uh, then uh, one and a half years ago was the same situation where I wanted to profile stuff. And the problem was, yeah, I got to this and was like, mm, there should be a better way. But there wasn't any better way in the open source world. And so um, I asked my boss, hey, can I work on this? And it was like, yes. Because also with our stakeholders were like, we don't want to use these. So, um, we, we, I worked on um, uh, the first open source profiling plugin for IntelliJ. It's still a prototype, but you can download it. It's open source. Um, you can get it from the uh, uh, JetBrains marketplace and, and just run it. And the cool thing is, when you have, for example, a main method, you can just, when you install it, you can just right click and tell it, oh, please profile this application with JFR or go for it with async profiler. Now we're profiling it with JFR, and then it profiles it, and then opens the view. And if someone finds it familiar, it's essentially a Firefox profiler, just extended, um, so it works for our use case here. And so you get a, the, the tree, the, the method tree, you can also double click on it, and it shows, and it goes back to the code and you can shift double click and it shows you which lines are hit how many times. And so it has tight integration with your, t uh, with your IDE. And you can also get flame graphs. You see here the Fibonacci number is really recursive. And it shows you directly, oh, this method was chit compiled most of the, ran chit compiled most of the time. And you can also see all the events. Um, yes, <laughs> when the beam are like. That's computers. Anyone wonders why they didn't start a bakery? Um, <laughs> I think 
yeah, now it, now it works again. Consider you, you, you're starting a bakery, you just bake bread and it smells delicious and we're sitting here. It's, it's nice outside, why are you here? No. Um, <laughs> because J. Bram is a real nice conference. Uh, so that's why we are all here. Um, that's why I came from, from Castle to show you this. And I think um, sometimes computers make me mad, but then we develop nice applications like this, and then we're like, cool. And, and now the Beamer works hopefully for the rest of my presentation. Anyway, um, you might wonder what the impact of profiling on your performance is. The impact is kind of there. Um, so JFR with a reduced setting, it's like typically below 2%. And when you increase the amount of data that you're recording, of course, the performance impact increases. But of course, also the data, uh, the amount of data that you get increases. And funnily enough, the JFR file format might not be the most efficient. Um, that's what I'm currently working on too. Um, so it might help to just compress the JFR files afterwards. But anyway, the performance impact is usually negligible, but the problem is you can't say it for every application. It really depends on the applications, on how many cores you have, how many memory, on how much memory you have in a specific configuration. So what I would recommend, test your profiling tools before on a small system, before going to a larger system where you might have strains. And a thing that many people ask me when, I, when I'm doing this presentation was like, but what about continuous profiling? So profiling along the way. If I'm honest, that's not what I'm working on, so I've limited experience, but um, um, an easy way uh, to continuously profile is just to ask async profiler, hey, please, um, give me a profile of this JVM every like minute, and then you can also tell like, but please store only like the ten last um, JFR files, and so you get some kind of continuous profile. So when you have a problem, you can just take the profile from the specific time. Then there's of course tools like Pyroscope, um, which is really cool because essentially you have an agent running in your JVM on application performance monitor that sends back the data to Pyroscope, which is an open source application, which then shows you the flame graphs and such. And there are also many, many more. There's, for example, Giga and, and other tools, and also commercial tools um, that you can use for this. So to conclude, um, uh, I think um, the profiling tools belong should really belong to your toolbox, because you shouldn't start profiling when you're in, when you're in the evening sitting in your uh, sitting at your organization being like, why doesn't this work after we start it every minute? Um, that's not the point where you should start learning profile on Tool. It's, it's like you should start it essentially now after my talk to learn about these tools and you hear my talk, which is a good start, um, as well as you should start learning how to debug and how to write tests to prevent these issues from coming up in the first place. Um, and for any reason, that's like what Montreal looks in the window. Um, <laughs> I don't know where it is there, but anyway, um, when you want to see other stuff of me and when you want to see um, where, where I give my next presentations, you can head on Twitter or Mastodon to Paradigm Nerd. Um, you find me on GitHub. Um, you find my blog where I write every two weeks on topic usually related to Java, EPPF, profiling, debugging at mostlynerdless.de. Um, and the, my team, you can find it under its sweet submachine, and you can find our website is submachine.io, where we post all the cool stuff that we're doing. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks for having me, and thanks to J Prime for flying me in, for giving me the opportunity to visit Sofia for the first time. Despite all the traffic jams, your your city center is really nice. Like being in church, it's like. 1,700 years old is really awesome, and the bakeries that you have here. So um, uh, thanks for, for being here. Thanks for not being um, at a different talk, and uh, to show my boss that I'm actually working. That's always the problem. I'm doing presentations, and I'm like, uh, cheers. Woo. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, um, and have a nice day at Shape Prime. <laughs>